some of them again. Um, students, first of all, for you, I should have printed earlier today, and I didn't get it done until after school, but we do have your individual schedules as they stand at this point. You'll get your final schedules once you get to regionals. But um, I have those in the back there, opposite from the display table, kind of behind that wall on another little table. They should be there in alphabetical order. If you want yours and you want to take it with you tonight, you may. And then parents, you may look at those as well, take pictures, whatever you want to. Those schedules should be posted to Facebook yet sometime this weekend. Someone said they had checked earlier today and they still weren't posted. Um, but I had access to them in the, pro in the registration program. Know, though, that those, I think, could still be subject to change. So if you show up and say, but I saw, maybe it changed after that. Um, so anyway, students, if you want those, pick them up later this evening. For all of you, hopefully you, you might have already seen this, but we have a display table in the um, back over here on my right. And then there's also one down in the vestibule where probably many of you came in. Um, so you can check out the artwork and photography and other things that are there. You may still come up, people. That's fine. We hadn't quite officially started, but Mr. Kenton, are we ready to start now? Let me say before they go that on Sunday evening we're planning to do an event in here and we have been rehearsing with some wireless microphones and that stuff's already set up and didn't want to change too many things so we're in the middle of trying to make two systems work with each other and I will have to run between downstairs and upstairs depending on what we're doing so just bear with us we'll try to make it as good as we can thanks yeah I was going to comment on some of that too so this event can tend to be fairly informal already, and tonight might be a little extra much that way with some of the things we have going uh, last minute, uh, change of location and, and um, change of sound techs and things like that. So uh, we appreciate the people making it work, and Andre Petersheim consented last minute to live stream, so if um, you're watching the live stream, welcome to you also. All right, we have, as I had announced at Mountain View Church earlier, when I announced about this event, we have probably less entries for platform this year than what we have sometimes in the past, and for sure less music. But the exciting thing is we also have some things that we haven't had in the past always, and so we're hoping to feature some of that uh, this evening as well. One of those, and I'll maybe just comment on or give you an introduction now, um, Actually, I think it's the first thing up here. Uh, I didn't study my schedule closely, but the first thing up is a PowerPoint. So we've had, we had two teams, as it were, two pairs of people do a PowerPoint this year, design one, and those get sent in ahead of time to be judged, and then they get recognized at convention if they, if they place in that. So it's nothing that they need to do while they are there. They don't even need to display it while they're there. They just designed it and sent it in. These are designed and intended to just be um, like you can, you just view them. You play them and they play through and you watch them. There's no kind of presentation with it. So what you see on the screen is what you get. Um, so you can enjoy those. We have two of those this evening. And then uh, we have a dramatic dialogue and a couple singing things and then some speaking things as well, which haven't always been typical for us. So we're excited about that, um, and then we will wrap up the evening with a one-act play. I'll get back up and introduce some of the specifics, but I think what I'm going to do for now is open in prayer, and then after that we will look for the PowerPoint, and following that we'll look for the dramatic dialogue, um, and then I'll get back up, Jairus, before your first one. Okay? So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening. Thank you for this group of people that came out, people who are interested and or connected to the school um, and interested in, in what we do and what the students have to offer. And I pray that this evening could be a blessing both to performers and, both, and also the audience who is here. I pray that, um, that the messages that are shared uh, through song and speaking uh, would be a blessing and would honor and glorify your name. 
Thank you for bringing us here safely. We pray that we would get home safely later as well. Thank you for a dry place to be when it's uh, chilly and wet outside. Bless the performers as they do their pieces. Help them to do their best, calm their nerves, and pray that it could be a good evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Ah, you got the light. Thank you. While the, di the dramatic dialogue people come, I failed to recognize who designed that PowerPoint. That was done by Kia and Shauna.
I guess this won't work. Yeah, maybe this will work. Uh, what's going on now is he's using lapel mics, and those are controlled up there. So he has to run back up there. He'll be back, or he'll be ready shortly. Hi. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hi, testing. Right. Well, say your name, where you're from, what you Hello, my name is Alana Yoder, and I'm Jonica Moser. We're a dramatic dialogue for Mountain View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania. And the title of our dramatic dialogue is Grace and Truth, Personal Trainers by Cherie Mann. Hey, are you lost? Well, sort of, I guess. I just got hired as a personal trainer, and the guy who did my interview told me to come in here and find truth. But to be honest, I don't know what he's talking about. Is that some sort of new exercise? <laughs> Not quite. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Truth. Oh, <laughs> Truth. That's an unusual name. People say it fits me. I pretty much tell it like it is. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Truth. I'm Grace. Nice. Your name fit you? Yeah, I guess so. Cool. Well, it looks like you'll be with me today. I'll teach you the ropes. First thing is, you've got to keep these slackers going. <laughs> hey, Mr. Flabby Arms, get back on that bench. Those biceps need at least another 50 reps. Go on. Oh, and your friend there? Yeah. You. You've been skipping leg day, haven't you? I want to see 20 squats. Yes, now. See, they'll try to get out of here without a real workout. Wow, I'm not sure Ooh. I... Go ahead, give it a try. Well, okay. Excuse me, you sir? Is your treadmill working? Oh, wait, I see. It's moving a little. Hey, good job on the walking. You're doing great. Just try not to spill your soda on the machine. What was that? Just trying to be encouraging. Nobody will get healthy that way. You have to tell people what they need to hear. Well, that just seems a little harsh. Well, letting people eat cookies on the treadmill is too soft. Case in point, look at that woman on the mat. She came in here showing me pictures of her newborn and saying she was here to lose the baby weight. But she's tried to sneak off that mat three times in the last 20 minutes. And look, she's just lying there again. Stop, just look at her. Will you really look at her? She's, she's asleep. Asleep, right there on the mat. She's exhausted, Truth. Can't you see that? I say we wake her up and make her do 20 more sit-ups. She needs to do the work. I say we wait until she wakes up and then look at baby pictures with her at the coffee shop. She needs some rest. You're too soft. You're too harsh. All right, 10 sit-ups. Five. And we do them with her and encourage her the whole way? Okay, but I'll do the sit-ups. You do the encouraging? Deal. Can we still look at baby pictures over a latte? If you go tell Cookie Guy to eat his veggies. Ugh, can't I just suggest oatmeal raisin cookies? <laughs> you know, I have a feeling we're going to make a good team. Yeah, grace and truth. Personal trainers. <laughs> I think you mean truth and grace, personal trainers. I don't know. Grace and truth just, got, just has a ring to it. Yeah, like one of those cheap rings that turns your finger green. How about truth and trace? You need a latte. That's the truth. All right, thank you, ladies. Well done. 
Okay, uh, next, once he gets his mic on, uh, Jairus Bender will be coming and doing an oratory, and I will confess that I should have asked Mr. Kenton ahead of time. I, have we ever had anybody do an oratory? Do you remember? While well, he thinks about that, I don't know that I know the exact definition of what, con of what makes an oratory. Do you want to give me information to relay to them, or do you want to... Okay, sure. So, Jairus, you can maybe do that when you get up here then. Um, but he, he will be doing an oratory, and again, I'm excited about having a, a, um, a category like this, an entry uh, like this. And then following his oratory, we will have two singing um, events, a mixed duet and a female trio. So I will let you all come right after uh, Jairus' oratory then. I think we're still getting mic'd up over here, so we will just pause a little bit there. Oh, yes. Is that just up on center stage here for him? Yeah. Well, since I've been introduced already, I won't bother you with that. An oratory is basically a uh, persuasive speech or something of the sort. It's uh, similar to how, like a lecture or something that professors do in college. It's pretty similar to that. Anyway. You have to write yeah, you have to write it yourself. Well, anyway. As I previously said, my name is Jerris Bender from Mount View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania, and the title of my oratory is Pro-Life, God's Choice. Between the years of 1973 and 2022, it is estimated that 63 million children were murdered. These children lost their lives to abortion. We as Christians are called to be pro-life and work to eradicate abortion from society. I will provide evidence the unborn child is a distinct human life and discuss why and how Christians should be pro-life. First, the unborn child is a distinct being. From the moment of conception, the unborn child has his or her own gender, which potentially may differ from the mother. The unborn child has its own DNA, 50% from the mother and 50% from the father. At five weeks, the unborn child is a heartbeat. At around six weeks, its fingerprints have begun to form. At the same time, the brain and lungs have also begun to form. All the evidence clearly shows the unborn child is a distinct being separate from the mother. Secondly, the unborn child is a human being. Because both of its parents are human, the unborn child must also be a human. Just as God declared in Genesis 1, dogs have pups, cats have kittens, and humans have children. Thirdly, the unborn child is alive. From the moment of conception, the unborn child is growing. Only living things can grow. Again, at five weeks, the unborn child has a heartbeat. At around eight to ten weeks, the unborn child can feel pain. This means when an unborn child is dismembered in an abortion, it can feel that pain. All the evidence clearly shows the unborn child is a distinct human life. As Christians, we should advocate for the unborn. God values all human life. In Exodus 21, 22-25, God demanded restitution for a pregnant woman and her unborn child when someone caused a premature birth. Abortion is essentially a premature birth. The unborn child leaves its mother's womb before it is time. Psalm 139, 13b, and 16a say, You knit me together in my mother's womb. You saw me before I was born. What did God see? Not a clump of cells, but a soul. God and his word are clearly pro-life. So what can we as Christians do to stop abortion? 
we are clearly commanded to be pro-life. One of the responses we should consider is adoption. According to the Charlotte Lozier Institute, in, in 2020, there were over 930,000 abortions and only 19,658 private domestic infant adoptions, meaning abortions outnumbered private domestic adoptions 50 to 1. Secondly, the pastors of America need to fervently preach on the sanctity of human life. It is my firm belief the reason churches are surrendering on this issue is the lack of teaching from the biblical worldview. As Dr. Michael Youssef stated, as goes the pulpit, so goes the pew. As goes the pew, so goes the nation. Another Christian response to abortion is to vote for pro-life candidates in every election. If Christians leave politics, then evil will be legislated. Abortion will go unchecked, and millions, if not billions, of lives and souls will be lost. In Mark 12, 31a, we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. How loving is it to see our neighbor, the unborn child, dismembered in an abortion when we as Christians could have stopped that abortion by voting or running for a political office? Christians should also provide funds needed at crisis pregnancy centers. According to PolitiFact, upwards of 90% of women seeking an abortion decide not to have an abortion after seeing an ultrasound of, our, of their child. Lastly, Christians can provide sidewalk counseling. We can offer alternatives and the solution of the gospel to the women seeking an abortion. We can proclaim the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to the women seeking an abortion. We can also proclaim that same saving grace to the women and abortionists who do this terrible thing. Perhaps the only way they will know the saving gospel is if you and I offer it to them. In conclusion, the unborn child is a distinct human life made in the image of God. Christians are called to stand for the unborn and work to eradicate abortion from society. We are indeed called to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Proverbs 31, 8a. Stand up, speak up, and never back up. Pro-life is God's choice. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bronson Kaufman. And I'm Keanu Beachy. And we are a mixed duet from Mountain View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania. And the song we will be singing for you is Knowing You, Jesus.
Uh, we would just like to say that we are not quite as prepared as we would like to be, but we're going to give it a shot and see how it goes. Uh, that being said, my name is Lauren Yoder. I'm Keanu Beachy. And I'm Shauna Peterson. And we are a female trio from Mountain View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania. And the title of the song we'll be singing for you is Well Done. What will it be like? When my pain is gone And all the worries of this world just fade away What will it be like When you call my name And that moment when I see you face to face I'm waiting my whole life to hear you say
So I think we'll just go ahead and do the ensemble next. All right, the next thing is going to be the small ensemble. So you can start making your way up here. Um, Cody, could you, I left my sheet music lying over there on the table. If you could grab that and bring it down for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, did Byron Miller make it here tonight? Byron, Byron, Byron? Nope. Okay. Um, because I was just going to thank him for working his magic on that last song. Um, because I think the, the piano music that we had, or the, thank you, the sheet music that we had for it wasn't all that great, and he did something really special with that song, I thought. All right. Um, sorry. I just want you to hit that then, just don't let it fall asleep. Okay. All right, so um, this song uh, was, you, you get these, there, you buy a song from this company once, and forever after you get emails from them. But you don't quite dare to say, no, I'm unsubscribing, because then maybe you'll miss something great. And this was a song that showed up in my inbox and I went and listened to it. I was like, you know, I think that that will make a small ensemble song. And so I uh, made a note of it and um, I don't know, eight months later maybe um, came the time and I pulled it out and I played it for these students and um, they agreed they'd be willing to do it. And uh, I trust that you will enjoy this song. I love this song. And the title of this song we will be singing for you this evening is Look to the Land.
have another PowerPoint, and this one I think was done by Samantha and Trina. Is that right? The next PowerPoint. So uh, you can enjoy that afterward, and then we will close out with a one-act play. You'll have to give us a bit of time to get the stage set and everything in place for that. Um, and I will, well, no, I'll comment then, I think. Jairus, you can come ahead and share your sermon. Well, here's for round two. My name is Jairus Bender from Mount View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania, and the title of my sermon is The Lie of Gay Christianity. More and more in America, homosexuality is becoming culturally acceptable. According to a poll by Gallup, 64% of American adults think that homosexuality is morally acceptable. 64%. The church has traditionally been against homosexuality. However, over the past few years, there have been no shortage of gay marriages in the churches of America. There have even been pastors that are openly homosexual. Over the past 10 years, the LGBTQ plus movement has become increasingly active in the churches of America. People have been saying to get with the times, but what does God say in his word? I'll discuss why Christians are forbidden to affirm homosexuality and how we, as God-honoring believers, are supposed to respond to those who are entrapped in this lifestyle. What did God say through divine revelation in the Old Testament about homosexuality? Leviticus 18.22 says, Do not practice homosexuality. It is a detestable sin. The punishment for homosexuality in the Old Testament is found in Leviticus 20.13. It says, If a man practices homosexuality, both men have committed a detestable act they must be put to death, for they are guilty of a capital offense. Some will say, why does it matter? It's in the Old Testament. The answer to this question is twofold. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Furthermore, Paul and the other early church fathers quoted the Old Testament. They clearly thought the Old Testament held weight in the New Covenant. God was vocal in the Old Testament about homosexuality, but what did he say in the New Testament? Romans 1, 26 and 27 says this in regards to homosexuality. That is why God abandoned them to the shameful desires, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or are greedy people, or drunkards, or abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. God has clearly spoken against homosexuality in both the Old and New Testaments. God's design for marriage is revealed to us in Genesis 1.27 where it states, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. According, yeah, my bad. Jesus affirmed this in Matthew 19, 4, when he responded to the Pharisees by saying, Haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. So how should Christians respond to homosexuality? First, Pastors need to preach biblically-based sermons on the subject. According to the Pew Research Center, 36% of evangelicals approve of homosexuality. Even more alarming, Pew found 51% of evangelical millennials believe homosexuality should be accepted by society. One of the biggest reasons churches are surrendering on this issue 
is because pastors are not preaching out against homosexuality. Secondly, we need to reach out with love and evangelize those who are in the LGBTQ plus community. Ephesians 4.15 tells us we should speak the truth in love. Some seem to have labeled homosexuality as an unforgivable sin, but that is not true. 1 John 1.9 indicates there is forgiveness through Christ for all who call upon his name. The church must also come alongside believers who are struggling with same-sex attraction. If you are a believer who is struggling with homosexuality or any sin for that matter, if you have repented, you are forgiven. If you ask me, how do I know? Look to the cross and the empty grave. All the assurance of forgiveness needed is that cross where Jesus laid down his life. All the assurance of forgiveness needed is that tomb where the stone was rolled away, where death, sin, and Satan were resoundingly and eternally defeated. If you have repented, you are forgiven. In conclusion, Christians are forbidden to affirm homosexuality. However, they are commanded to respond in love to those who feel trapped in this lifestyle. I challenge the church of Jesus Christ to stand firm on the grounds of biblical sexuality. I challenge the same church to reach out with love to those who are enslaved by Satan in this accursed trap. Shine the light of Jesus into one of the darkest nights. Show the open door out of one of the darkest prisons. I urge you, speak life and hope into lives filled with despair. Do all of this in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Thank you.
Okay, give us just a little bit here to set the stage for the one-act play. I will comment here. It will be announced, I think. But this was written, and um, it was written by Rhonda, used to be Kinsinger, uh, who was a monitor at our school. And I think she first headed up a group in doing it uh, back in her time working there. And it is being done again this year. So hopefully you will enjoy this. They chose not to have lapels on these people, so those of you on the live stream might not, uh, I don't know what all you'll pick up. Hopefully those of you here will hear them. If not, you may tell them later that they need to speak up. <laughs> now, anyway, they're not going to have mics, just so you know. My name is Bronson Kaufman. I'm Blake Yoder. I'm Shauna Peterson. I'm Keanu Beachy. And I'm Donica Moser. And we are a one-act play from Mountain View Christian School in Springs, Pennsylvania. And the title of the play we, we, we will be performing for you tonight is Spaces of the Cross by Rhonda Kinsinger. <laughs> the Cross. The single greatest event in history. It changed the landscape of the world forever. <clears throat> Looking back, we see what God had in mind and how his plan for redemption unfolded through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. However, what about the people who lived back then? Those who didn't know how the story would turn out. What were they thinking and feeling as they either watched or heard about the death of this man, Jesus? Go back in time with us and imagine what a few of those people may have been experiencing in the days between the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. How could I be so stupid? What was I thinking? Why did I think that the money was worth betraying my friend? Jesus was never anything but kind to me. And now he is dead because of my choices. I just don't get it. Why didn't he get away from them? I thought I could get some money and in the end, he would just escape like he did every other time they tried to get him. Why did Jesus let them kill him? This money isn't worth anything to me now. 
It's like poison to my soul. I can't stand myself. I'm sure if he was still alive, Jesus would forgive me. But I can't forgive myself. If Jesus is dead, life just isn't worth living anymore. supposed to do. But you could have stood up for what you knew was right instead of being a coward and came into what the crowd wanted. But they were getting completely out of control. They probably would have killed me if I hadn't given them what they demanded. Is that what you want? For me to be killed? Of course not. I fear though that the wrath of the crowd may not have been as fierce as the wrath of God is going to be. If this Jesus truly was who he claimed to be, and according to my dreams, I would say he is, then you just allowed them to kill the Son of God. I still can't believe they wanted Barabbas released instead of Jesus. Why would they want a hardened criminal instead of a man who was clearly innocent? Oh God, forgive me for condemning an innocent man to death. Wow, who was that man? He wasn't like any criminal I ever helped crucify before. Everyone always curses at us and tries to get away, but not him. It was almost as if he wanted us to crucify him. When he was mocked and taunted, he didn't yell back. In fact, he didn't say anything. And when he died, when he died, it was like the whole earth was groaning and crying out. There really isn't any other explanation than that this man really was who he claimed to be. <clears throat> this man truly was the Son of God. My son, oh my son, why did he have to die? Why did God have to take him away from me? I don't know, Mary. I don't understand where the sense is in this. Why did Jesus allow himself to be killed? He had the power to stop them. I know he did. He cast demons out of me, and he changed my life forever. And he did so many other miracles. So why now did he lay down his power and allow them to kill him? I have always known that God had a special plan and purpose for him. But why this? How does his death fit into all of this? I thought he was going to save the world. But how can he do that if he is dead? Mary, we can't let go of hope. We can't just believe that this is the end. We have to believe that there is more to this plan than what we can see right now. There has to be a reason for this happening. God isn't finished writing this story yet. We have to believe that. I know. I do trust God's heart. And I know that he can bring good from this. I have seen him do the impossible before. And I'm sure he can do it again. It's just so hopeless and dark right now. He was my son, and now he is dead. How do I get over that? Keep trusting, Mary. God will get you through. I have seen the power of Jesus firsthand, and I'm convinced that he isn't done showing us that power. Oh God, give me strength to go on. I can't make it without you. Freedom? Freedom! I can't believe I'm free. I shouldn't be free. Why did they free me? I deserve death, not freedom. I have not exactly lived a good life. People say that some man named Jesus was crucified. And that's why they released me. They say, 
It even looked like they, he went with them willingly. Who would do that? I wish I knew more about him. I wonder if he knew that he was buying my freedom. And if so, did he know who I am? If he had known, I don't think he ever would have died in my place. He gave me a second chance at life. I wish there was some way to thank him. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we too have a second chance at life. The question then is, what will we do with that second chance? Will we turn away from it? Or will we accept it and allow it to change our lives forever? Well, you heard the challenge. Each of those characters had a story and each of us have a story. And they were each wrestling with Jesus in their story. And each of us have the choice of what to do with him in our story. Hopefully you've been blessed being here. Thank you for coming and showing your support and interest in this way. If you think of us next week, pray for us as we go. Uh, we plan to meet at the school at 740 on Monday morning and head out, and we will probably get back on Friday evening, maybe 7 o'clock range, somewhere in there. So it, it's always a long week. It's usually a good week, uh, a week of memories, a week of um, blessing and challenges. And so if you think of us, pray for us. Thank you for your support, and I'm sure we will see some of you uh, out there as well. So thank you um, for those who come. Thank you for those who support from here. I don't know that I have any more comments other than maybe just a few reminders. And then if any of you have questions, maybe I'll even open it up a little bit if any of you have any. But just a reminder to students, if you want your schedules, they're in the back left there just before you head out the auditorium door. And for all the rest of you, uh, displays on the back right here and then down in the uh, vestibule where you come in. Uh, any questions or Mr. Kenton, anything that I should be saying that I'm not thinking about saying? Any questions about the week? Some of us are so close to it that we maybe don't think about the questions that other people might have. All right, if not, let's stand and we'll have a closing word of prayer and then you are dismissed. Father, I thank you for this evening. Thank you for the work that has gone into it. Thank you for those who uh, worked last minute here to make it possible and, and make it work uh, here at this place. And I pray that you would bless those who came, bless us as we go, bless the group as uh, we go next week. And I pray um, that everything would be done for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.